Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Pablo and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you experience any technical difficulties joining the session, please message the WebEx producer using the QA panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the QA panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Please keep the drop down as all panelists. I'd like to introduce your speaker for today, Kyle. Kyle, you now have the floor. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Chilling Out with Randell Refrigeration. I'm Kyle with the marketing team at Partstown, and I'm joined by our presenters, Dave Rademacher, a refrigeration product manager at Unified Brands, and Scott Sandel, a field support manager at Unified Brands. At Partstown, safety is our number one core value. So before we get started, we want to remind everyone on the line that if you have issues with your equipment performance or questions about any of the procedures discussed in this presentation, we strongly recommend that customers contact a factory authorized service agent who can help with your specific unit and all your commercial kitchen equipment needs. And now let's turn it over to Scott. Actually, I'm, uh, this is Dave Rademacher. I'm, I'm actually going to kick us off here. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, our agenda for today is to cover some uh, tips for restarting and shutting down refrigeration equipment. And uh, discuss some preventative maintenance best practices and then also discuss some troubleshooting and common questions that there might be with refrigeration. Uh, touch base on uh, why to shop at parts town and then we'll uh, jump into a question and answer and discussion. So, uh, like we said, if there's any questions uh, as we present, uh, please submit those in that Q and a panel. So as far as refrigeration tips for restarting equipment after it's been a off a off for a certain period, uh, which many restaurants have experienced in the in the past year or so here, uh, most importantly, when you're restarting a refrigerator, you you want to make sure that unit has been fully cleaned and sanitized. It's much easier to do this uh, before restarting the unit. Uh, other other things include is ensuring that your drain lines are not restricted. So uh, this means your condensation lines that are running from the evaporator coil inside of the refrigerator. Uh, you want to make sure that that's clear. So when you start the refrigerator up, you're you're not having any condensation backing up or uh, liquid flowing onto the floor uh, as the unit starts to produce condensation. Uh, and then, depending on the type of unit, uh, with with Randell prep tables, a large majority of them are a cold wall cooled style prep table, meaning that the rail or the pan opening up in the top of the unit is is separated from the base, and those also have a drain in them for cleaning. So uh, that's that's one of the other things you want to make sure that you're you're clear on is you can see. Uh, make sure that that drain line is clear as well. <clears throat> uh, another thing is you want to make sure that the your gaskets, uh, you want to inspect those, make sure that they're clean and they haven't been damaged. Uh, that just, again, cleanliness and then damage it to the gaskets, just kind of make sure that your unit keeps all the cold inside as efficiently as possible and doesn't cause any additional condensation or allow any uh, freezing of your coil inside. And then uh, last but not least was to inspect your silicone seams. There's a handful of seams that are siliconed throughout the units. Uh, and those can, that silicone in those joints can come loose over time as you clean the units. Uh, it's very, uh, just varies depending on where it is on the unit, but uh, they, they can certainly the silicone can pull away from those seams. So it's always good to just keep an eye on those and make sure you reapply that to the seams as needed.
So as far as uh, shutting down the equipment, so if you are planning on shutting the equipment down, uh, you want to uh, make sure that you basically just uh, clean, clean and sanitize the unit. Let me go back to slide here. So uh, again, uh, very important to clean and sanitize the unit before you shut the equipment down. Uh, and shutting down is really, really means like for an extended period of time. It's it's not just shutting it down overnight or uh, a short period, but uh, if we go into a, a situation like we, we have over the last year or so here, uh, you certainly want to make sure that your unit's fully cleaned and sanitized. And then once that's completed, we always recommend to keep the doors open, uh, just propped open just enough so you can get airflow in there. Uh, and that'll prevent mold and mildew from uh, occurring inside of the unit. So uh, as far as maintenance and best practices, uh, number one, of course, is have it, have a cleaning schedule. Uh, have one and follow it. That's, that's the best thing you can do is just uh, keep after the units, make sure that they stay clean. Uh, it's much easier to clean uh, stuff that's been there for a matter of days instead of uh, stuff that's built up over the matter of weeks or months. So. Uh, you know, have a schedule, keep after it. Uh, it makes units much more clean and sanitized and easier to uh, maintain. So as far as a uh, maintenance schedule, the the one thing that we recommend doing daily, like I mentioned earlier, the, the majority of Randall prep tables are a cold wall style, meaning that the the pan opening on the prep tables are completely separated from the base. And like I mentioned, we have a drain inside of that compartment. So that makes cleaning and sanitizing them very easy. So we recommend doing that daily. Uh, other other styles of prep tables that are cooled with forced air, meaning that the base of the cabinet is, is pushing the air up over the pans. Uh, those are a little more cumbersome to clean, uh, but even Randall produces both style units, but we we recommend cleaning and sanitizing that daily, uh, just because that's where the highest contact of uh, food is at. So the one thing that we recommend to inspect and clean weekly are the gaskets. Uh, so on the Randall tables, they're very easy to replace the gaskets. Uh, you can see the nice wide channel here where this gasket's pulled away. Uh, you can see the gasket in the photo in the center there. Uh, it's got some crud buildup on it, some mold and mildew in that unit. Uh, so you just simply pull that gasket out. Uh, we recommend just a mild detergent and water. Uh, do not, we don't recommend submersing the uh, gasket in water because uh, it is it is not always fully sealed uh, it, especially as they start to wear and get some uh, cracks and crevices in them they, they can take on water if you immerse them in water so we recommend just a mild sanitizer mild detergent and uh, warm water just wipe them down let them air dry and then once they're have air dried just uh, pop them back into the doors uh, or or the drawers so it's uh, very easy to uh, replace them and keep them maintained and uh, a clean gasket will last much longer uh, than one that you neglect. So that's something we recommend to do on a weekly basis. Uh, and then moving on to uh, items that we, we recommend to check out monthly. Uh, first one being uh, make sure you inspect and keep the condenser coil cleaned. Uh, like you can see on uh, some of the photos here. Back down here. Yeah, so the uh, condenser coil, it's it's very critical to ensure that that that's kept clean. That's that's your number one thing that allows your unit to perform. Uh, both efficiently and effectively. Uh, so if, if you don't keep that condenser coil cleaned out, you're you're not going to allow your refrigeration system to extract heat, which in turn allows the unit to cool. Uh, one thing we we don't recommend is is putting a filter 
medium in the front of the condenser coil. Uh, these restrict airflow. And uh, I think when when we were talking with uh, Scott Sandal yesterday, he he referenced yeah, that uh, uh, these these, these filters these are filters. similar to uh, you know running upstairs with a mask on. So it's a lot different than uh, back before everyone was wearing masks to run up a couple of flights of stairs and put a mask on there, and you can tell it's a lot harder to breathe through them. So you're doing the same thing to your refrigeration system by adding something to the front of it. So uh, you're really just making it harder for your refrigeration system to perform uh, efficiently and effectively. So uh, what we recommend for that is just using a a, bra a stiff bristle brush or uh, vacuuming the, the face of those just to keep the coil itself clean. So uh, drain lines and valves, like I mentioned earlier, uh, on like your shutdown things, uh, if you're going to be shutting down for a while or restarting after downtime, uh, make sure you inspect those drain lines and the valves. Make sure that those are clear. Uh, most importantly, the condensation line that comes off from the unit. So uh, if you if you get items built up in there, the it can let your condensation drain overflow or even uh, b back up into the refrigerator. So if you start seeing condensation occur inside the refrigerator, one one of the potential things that could be occurring is that the drain line is clogged up. So uh, that's one good thing to check out. The silicone seams. So on a couple of these units here, that, that bottom center photo of the pan rail, there's a couple seams inside of here that, that we use silicone um, in, in the corners. So what that does, that, that creates a, a better radius corner. So it's not a, a tight, tight, corner where uh, crud can build up into. So that's why we use silicone in these seams, just so it uh, creates a wider radius in the corner, allowing it to be cleaned out more easily and not letting stuff build up as easily. So uh, those are some of those seams that you're going to see on not just Randell equipment, but everyone's equipment uh, with the use of silicone to create a radius cleanable edges. So that's something you just want to keep after, uh, be cognizant of. Uh, make sure that you uh, re reapply silicone as needed. Uh, one thing to note with the silicone especially is all silicone is not the same. Uh, when you are reapplying silicone, make sure that you are using an NSF approved silicone, meaning that it's food grade. So if it does happen to get into food product, you're not going to get anyone sick. And uh, last but not least on the monthly recommendation is Look at look at your hinge pins and your fastening mechanisms, uh, doors especially, uh, myself included. I mean, anyone that squats down in front of a refrigerator to look inside, you're you're constantly using that door as a crutch to stand back up, uh, especially after a long day. So, uh, those those are pieces that start to loosen up in time. So, uh, it's always good to go through and inspect these. Um, um, make sure that the you know the pins and everything's still tight in there so you're not losing any any components uh falling off the units yeah either whether it being a safety issue or even having uh nuts and bolts loosen up and fall into food product So next we wanted to talk about some of the common customer challenges that we see occur. Uh, just a handful of the ones that, that we happen to come up with uh, talking about. Um, one of the ones I, I encounter quite a bit is, is really selecting the correct equipment for the application. There's a wide variety of equipment in the market. There's a wide variety of stuff that uh, just Randell as a brand itself offers. So on the refrigeration side, there's a, just a lot of different variety. So you want to make sure that you're using the right equipment for the right application. For example, when folks are using a 
prep table for doing breading. Uh, it's very critical to use use a cold wall style prep table. Uh, forced air units just don't operate very well uh, when you're used in a breading situation. So they're very it's a very messy operation. So in turn, it's very hard to clean and sanitize that opening. Uh, especially considering you're you're breading a raw product typically, so uh, it's absolutely critical that you you keep that separated from the base, and then also have a a good way to easily clean that and sanitize the unit. Uh, covers on pan openings are a common problem that occurs. Uh, again, this sometimes uh, goes back to selecting the correct the correct equipment for the application. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, cold wall units typically perform better than a forced air unit, and uh, you'll see most forced air units, all all the Randell units, and even all the other manufacturers of the style unit in the market. They they typically put a a hood style cover or rollback cover on a forced air unit. And that's really just because it helps helps the unit contain the cold within the pan opening. Uh, whereas with cold wall, you you get better temperature performance. So, uh, putting covers or allowing the unit to not have covers in those environments, such as like Chipotle or Cadoba, where you're front of the house, where you, you need your customers to see the product. So, uh, covers can be a big big hindrance on performance of the units themselves. Um, water around electrical components, that's a common customer challenge. I'm sure uh, Scott could speak to this as well, uh, being on the service side of the business. Uh, but the the units really are not rated to be fully washed down by water. They're, they have a, a high resistance to a, a lot of water and a wash down or wipe down with them. but. Uh, we don't recommend spraying the equipment down uh, with pressure or any sort of uh, water water pressure being sprayed in. Uh, there's a lot of electrical components inside the system, and damaging one can uh, just create a create a more pro problems down the line with the other components that are connected. Definitely not. Yeah, we we do not recommend that uh, anything be power washed within the kitchen. Uh, many times the Customers or restaurants will will hire an outside entity to come in and clean the hoods and such, and uh, consequently, there uh, you'll see failures that usually the following day on some electrical components that may have gotten damaged. So, even just using an oversoaked rag, you want to stay away from that. Just use a you know a a, a rag that's rinsed uh, um, of any excess water to to wipe and sanitize the uh, oversoaked rag. If in the right spot, that water could seep into electrical components and cause damage to that. So definitely want to be cognizant of that. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so uh, next on our list here is uh, <clears throat> product placement uh, that creates airflow restrictions. So this can occur, uh, airflow restriction can occur in a few different areas, uh, one of them being at the compressor itself. So a lot of folks will, you know, find that the most convenient place to put a trash can on the line is not in front of the refrigerator door, but in front of the compressor. So uh, that very much restricts the the airflow to the compressor and then in turn uh, results in low performance by the unit itself because you're not allowing it to breathe cool air you're not allowing the system to eject heat and the refrigeration system to, to work so that's something to definitely be thoughtful of is uh you know where where you're placing trash cans and especially in front of those compressor areas uh, another thing is the airflow inside the cabinet itself so over over packing the base of a refrigerator where you uh, restrict the airflow out of that uh, coil, the evaporator coil inside of the base, uh, that can certainly cause you some issues, uh, mainly if you don't allow the air to fl flow freely out of the coil, you you can experience uh, freezing on the coil. Um, then also, depending on the style of unit it is, if it's 
a forced air unit where it's feeding the pan opening up top, the that's certainly going to restrict the amount of cool that uh, goes to the unit and holds the pans at the proper temperature. Um, and then also like when it is that style of unit where it's forced air and you're you're using the base air to cool your pans, if you over stack the product in the pans up above, that, that can also inhibit the performance of the unit uh, because many of the units are designed to have the air come up over the pans and settle in uh, on top of the pans. So by overstacking product in those pans above the top of the pan level, it doesn't allow any cold to set above the product. And as we all know, cold falls. So uh, if you can't get cold above the product, the product at the top is probably going to be at a temperature. So uh, next on our list was uh, raising the set point to high end controllers. Uh, this is something that uh, we see quite often. Um, maybe I'll have, Scott, if you'd like to, could you speak to this? Because uh, I'm sure you experience this uh, quite a bit more often than I do. Uh, yes, with the uh, with, with especially on the wrap rail um, controllers, the the wrap rail operates in a uh, in a cold setting, generally it's around a 10 degree evaporator temperature. So, uh, which means the controller has to be set accordingly to register that refrigerant temperature. Many times we see customers will raise that set temperature into the 30s, thinking it's a refrigerator and needs to be set at refrigerator temperatures. And then a day or two after setting that temperature in the 30s, um, we can get a, a phone call in regard to the unit running too warm. Um, so we want to make sure that that rail um, on the on the new R290 units with the Danfoss controllers is set generally below 25 degrees is what we what we see. Uh, liter our literature says below 30, but we really don't have any product in the field currently where the set point is above 25 degrees. So you want to check that. If there's ever, ever any question, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, to anybody in our service team. We can go through by your model number, serial number, let you know what the default setting is. From the factory on that and the ref refrigerator bases generally your those still will run refrigerator temperature and true refrigerator settings so any refrigerator base in, in the lower section those are going to be set in the uh, anywhere between 32 and 40 degrees is what you'll generally see on one of those well cool. thanks scott um, and then <clears throat> one last thing that we like to mention on when it comes to setting the temperature is when you're making those adjustments, uh, trying to dial in the, what that exact temperature is to, you know, be plenty cold, but not too cold is make those temperature setting adjustments in a small increment. So we, we recommend no more than two, maybe three degrees at a time and do that daily until you get where you need to be. Uh, so if you fluctuate these in, five or more degrees at a time, uh, it can become difficult to dial into the proper temperature setting that you need to be at. So we put together a list of uh, some equipment troubleshooting. Uh, these would be the most common things that uh, we see occurring, uh, starting with the unit not powering on uh, one one common thing that uh, Scott had mentioned when we were discussing this was uh, on the Dan Foss controllers for uh, which is pretty much our standard for all of our refrigeration right now. Uh, the control power button when you power the unit on, you actually you do need to hold it on for quite a long time, uh, five seconds or more to, uh, for the unit to power on. So that is something that we have seen occur. Uh, so that's just a, a pointer on those. And then also it might seem like an obvious one, but, you know, is the unit plugged in and then uh, tied to that is, you know, make sure that the breaker's not tripped because oftentimes there are circuits that have multiple things plugged into them. So uh, that can overload. And then as re refrigerators and compressors turn on, they do uh, spike the amperage uh, and draw a little bit extra and start up. So um, that's typically when you're going to see that breaker trip. 
so Scott spoke to these briefly uh, a moment ago. So the set point on the controller, uh, like he mentioned, the base is going to be reflective of a refrigeration temperature. So that's going to be anywhere from 32 to 40 degrees setting. And then the rail, uh, when, so this is when it, when you're looking at a, a prep table with a cold, cold wall style rail on it, uh, that, that is measuring refrigerant temperature. And uh, we typically see every, every unit is going to be set below 25 degrees as a standard. Uh, the units do have a, a little note on the overlay that says below 30 is standard or common. Uh, but these can go from 25 degrees all the way down to zero degrees on the refrigerant temperature. So again, do that in a two degree increments to get that dialed into exactly where you need it uh, to satisfy the environment that you're in and the temperatures you're trying to hold. Um, the condenser coil, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, keeping that clean is going to allow your unit to cool properly. Uh, again, uh, whether it's clean or if you have a trash can in front of it blocking the airflow, uh, regardless, it's uh, very important to uh, allow that to bring cooler air in and uh, get the heat out of the refrigerant and allowing the refrigeration system to cool properly and not just properly, but most efficiently as well. So the harder it works, the more energy it's going to take to perform that task. And then the evaporator coil uh, that, like we mentioned earlier, <clears throat> overloading that cabinet with product where you block up your evaporator coil that can cause that to ice up. And then other things that can cause it to ice up is if you're, you have a door or a drawer that happens to be propped open just a little bit. So maybe you have a, a pan in there that isn't fully pushed into the unit. So it's keeping that door or drawer propped open. Or it could also be something as simple as just the gaskets are have become very old and cracked and they're they're not sealing to the unit as well. So uh, that allows outside air to come into the unit, uh, creating more condensation and heat inside the cabinet, uh, which will also allow that evaporator coil to ice up on you. Uh, so that's something you really don't want to happen because that means you get to uh, empty everything out of the refrigerator and uh, defrost it while you while you wait for that coil to clear up before you can reload the cabinet back up. Yeah, generally it's an overnight uh, thawing is required. Uh, back to your comment, Dave, about the evaporator coil product, you know, loading the product and, and choking off the airflow and evaporator coil. General rule of thumb, if you can leave two inches of clearance between the intake air to the coil as well as the exhaust air to the coil, two inches clear on both, that would give you sufficient amount of room to prevent any blockage. The biggest uh, culprit of restricting airflow are bagged products. We see a lot of bagged products where they get stored in and right up tight against the intake or exhaust on the evaporator coils. That's a good pointer. All right, so um, do you want to talk about these next two on here, Scott, about the some of the odd things you might encounter with? Sure. sure. Um, a couple of things if a unit is uh, producing a noise that uh, is is new to you, so to speak. Um, generally, it's a fan blade that you hear. Um, fan blade hitting uh, you know, hitting something uh, such as a wire or ice. Ice is the most common with the evaporator coil. Um, back to the previous bullet where if the evaporator coil begins to uh, ice up, um, the fan blade could begin to hit that and make a ticking noise. Um, that that could be, uh, so that would be a common thing to look for if you hear that, uh, is for any ice on the coil. Or like I said, it could be a, a wire inside that has popped up uh, out of place where it shouldn't be, but that's uncommon, but but it can happen. Um, and same with the condenser fan motor inside your compressor compartment. Uh, you There is a fan blade in there. If that's been jostled any way, shape, or form, that could uh, be hitting something. Um, you won't see any ice in the condenser section, um, but it still could be a fan motor that's uh, uh, misaligned. Or if you hear other noises, it, it could be something uh, in line with the compressor. Um, the controller, if you see your controller showing some odd characters, for example, if it's supposed to read the maybe 36 degrees, but you're only making out something, a couple of dashes on there, and it's not you know, fully displayed, 
sometimes you just need to be rebooted um, with these controllers, similar to like your cell phone after a while you need to reboot. Um, it's not often, but it could be a power surge or something has caused it to to uh, malfunction or give you incorrect reading. So to do that, um, just simply unplug the unit from the wall. Um, unplug the unit from the wall, wait 30 seconds, plug it back in. Many times that will clear that uh, display and the controller will start to um, display its normal temperatures. If not, then indeed call for service. You know, call one of our service team or your local authorized service provider. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing to mention. So when when you do unplug the unit from the wall and when you replug it back in or when it gets power again, the unit will start in a defrost mode. So you will see that when you first start the unit up, it'll read DEF on the controller. Uh, and th that's a mechanism we built into the units purposely. So if the unit stops running because the coil senses that it has iced up, um, it'll put it into defrost. So if someone thinks that that's doing that improperly and they just unplug the unit to reset it, it automatically does start in a defrost cycle just to protect itself from jumping right into a cooling cycle and damaging the components inside of the coil. Good note. And uh, I guess on that same note, um, for any servicers out there, we, we after it comes out of defrost mode, um, the compressor will begin to cool again. However, it will still display DEF on the controller for defrost. However, you'll see a symbol on the display for the compressor uh, is, is cooling. So you'll have the compressor running while it's displaying DEF. That DEF on there is just until it gets back down to safe operating temperature, display temperature, put it that way. We don't want it showing a temperature that's when it first comes out of defrost that may alarm the customer that it may just be out of spec. So until it gets back down to its holding temperature, it'll show DEF on that display for a brief time. Great. Good to know. I didn't know that either, Scott. Right. So let's uh, jump over here to why the OEM parts are beneficial. So most importantly on the Randall side, uh, it, the the two high highest things of importance are the exclusive gasket design for Randall. Uh, like like you can see in the photo here, it's got a very wide channel. So this is an exclusive gasket design that we do uh, ourselves. Uh, only fits into our refrigerators. Although there has there are some companies that make uh, alternative gaskets that fit into our units, but they they're not the same as our spec. So using the OEM parts are very important to us. <clears throat> We've we we go through very very rigorous testing on all of our equipment uh, and even the components that go into them as well. So uh, using an OEM gasket and uh, our controllers, everything else around that is very important. So the material specification of the gasket, the size and tolerance, and everything, it just ensures a proper fit and it makes sure that you're gonna get the most life expectancy out of your gasket. Then, and most importantly, uh, it's going to save you energy uh, because you're going to ensure that your unit is sealed properly. So you're not going to create extra condensation in the cabinet, uh, potentially having some of that coil icing up that we've talked about a few times now. Uh, so uh, a good healthy gasket is, is a very important uh, thing to have in your refrigerator. Uh, and next up is uh, our controllers. So again, like I mentioned, we do rigorous testing on all of our units. So this includes programming our controls for various features, uh, like Scott and I were just discussing, uh, you know, the unit entering a defrost mode as it comes back online or com gets powered back up. So this is, you know, certain parameters that we've put into the controllers that ensures that you're going to have good performance and good reliability of the equipment. Uh, so you just you want to make sure that if and when you need to replace a controller that uh, you're doing that with uh, 
the exact settings and controllers that we've designed the units to use with. Um, and then it's also important on the controller side and even, even all the other components as well as uh, Randall, as well as most all, every other manufacturer has moved to uh, R290 refrigerant. The, all the components that go into these things are all listed under UL for compliance, uh, meaning that the unit's been tested for safety uh, and all the components operate at properly with the R290 refrigerant because uh, the, the, the refrigerant is flammable. So it's uh, goes through additional testing to ensure that uh, there's no potential for uh, safety issues. That's all I had. And let you have anything to add to that, Scott? Uh, with the with the controller, just a couple of things. Um, our controllers are. Uh, we may have one controller that we purchase, but we'll program it in many, many different ways, depending on the, the serial number, the model number, I should say, of the equipment. So uh, back to the importance of having the right controller with the with the right program file in, loaded into it. If, uh, if somebody's cutting corners and puts a wrong pro uh, program controller into a unit that may not have the right off time for the compressor, which means that the compressor could not have a, um, could be starting under high pressure and eventually cause damage to a compressor if it's not have the right parameter file in there. Um, we see we see customers they'll order a, a generic one one control fits all and um, which has many different parameters loaded into that than what we actually can see from the factory. So even our team, if a customer or service tech were trying to call us and go through and try to set a generic controller in the field, our team can't run through it completely with the customer just simply because we, we're, we're not familiar with all the nuances with uh, that are included in some of those generic controllers. Especially when you get to R290, that's of utmost important, uh, that importance. That's something that, um, back to safety, we don't wanna, uh, definitely don't want customers putting something in that's not gonna be compliant to, uh, to R290 refrigerant. Well, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think that is all we have from the Randall side, at least on the uh, let you know side of things. Uh, pass your back Great. to Kyle. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Dave and Scott, for sharing your expertise with all of us today. Uh, for everyone joining today, more information on Randall will be heading your way in a post event email, which includes the webinar replay more refrigeration tips, and best practices. Hartstown is proud to be the exclusive master distributor for Randell and all Unified Brands products. So be sure to visit Hartstown.com for your refrigeration parts needs. There are a few minutes left to take some questions, and we actually have some queued up for our attendees. The first question that I have here is, how often do gaskets need to be replaced? Um, I, I mean, gaskets, they're a, a wearable item, so it's, it's, it's kind of like anything. It's like how you treat them and take care of them is going to depend on how, how long they last. So, uh, it can really vary, uh, to be honest, I wish I had a more definitive answer for you, but, uh, it's really about maintenance. Uh, like we mentioned, you know, keeping them clean is certainly going to help them last longer. Uh, uh, the detergent that you use to clean them as well. Uh, we don't recommend any harsh detergents, uh, especially stuff that's uh, caustic, like a bleach or anything that can dry the gasket material out. That's going to cause that gasket to wear even faster. Um, I think one of the things that Scott mentioned when we were chatting the other day, uh, kind of preparing for this, was that they see in the service department the a tendency for gaskets on drawers or even doors that use sheet pans they have a tendency to wear out faster just because uh, folks may not put the pans fully into the seated down into the drawer or even when they pull stuff out they'll have the pan riding on top of the drawer they set it there to stage it before they set it into the unit so uh, 
Yeah, they can. It can really vary uh, on on how long your gaskets can last. Uh, we we do offer an optional gasket guard uh, that we put on can put on the doors and drawers, uh, which can help prolong the gaskets. But it just really depends on the application uh, if if that's going to be beneficial for you. Well, that certainly really does. One, one, I'm sorry, Kyle. Oh, um, one one tip I would recommend is you know the gaskets can be rotated uh, 180 degrees, so. Uh, when cleaning them, after you clean them with a mild soap and, and warm water, uh, flip them over. Um, you know, because they're going to wear from the top down. That's that's your wear, high usage wear point is at the top, so where it's ex most exposed. Uh, so if you flip them over uh, uh, each time you clean, that'll help prolong the life of them as well. <laughs> that is also really great info. Thank you for jumping in there, Scott. Uh, coming off of that question and related, how do customers know which size gaskets to purchase? Um, I'll take I'll a stab at that. that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. See, um, well, by model number, model or serial number, we we clearly have a, a bill of material by each model number and or serial number we can look up. Uh, um, the Parstown team also has that capability of doing so. But if all else fails, if you are unable to uh, identify um, model or serial number. Uh, basically, there's there's two things that we can uh, identify from you, that you can identify to us that we can get you the right gasket. Um, and that would be a what type of gasket it is, meaning how does it secure to the door, whether it's a push-in style that you see here. Um, many older versions of Randall units, you know, going back uh, 25 years plus, uh, were screw-in style gaskets. So if you if you gently pull back the edge of the gasket where it touches the door. You'll be able to see how it secures to the door, identify if it's screw in or push in, and then from there just simply measure it. Uh, outside to outside dimensions, left to right, and top to bottom, um, we can get the part numbers based off that. Great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and for, you, for you, you guys did, Yeah, so you guys did hear that right too. We, we do still have 25 year old units in the field, folks are still <laughs> sure using do. effectively today. Now, I know you got 25 year old units out on the floor still, but for a new unit, what are the startup procedures? Are there any instructions? And as a follow up, does that unit need to sit for 24 hours? Um, part B, it to sit for 24 hours. No, it does not, unless the customer has tipped it uh, more than uh, 20 degrees, you know, entering a doorway, uh, which we, we don't recommend. But if it does, then we do recommend it be is sit overnight. But if it's just coming uh, out of a crate straight up into a restaurant, no, there's no wait period. Um, just look it over, um, make sure that there's uh, no damage to it. Uh, you know, if it's a new piece, make sure all the, uh, when you do power it up, make sure all your fan motors engaged uh, are spinning properly, no noises, and just watch it to make sure it begins to cool properly. Um, all of our new owner's manuals has a brief uh, section in there about startup procedures for new equipment. So simply follow that, but it, it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Awesome. Um, when it comes to reapplication of food safe silicone, do you need an authorized service agent to reapply that silicone to the seams of the unit? Not necessarily. Um, you know, any anybody that's tried uh, handyman uh, home repair at work at home, excuse me, at home has uh, maybe had some experience in that. Uh, the main thing is removing the old silicone. You want to try to remove it the best you can, so there's no little pieces uh, here or there uh, that will not allow the new to to secure. And you want to make sure it's clean and uh, free of any oils uh, or dirt and dry mainly. You want to have a dry and at room temperature if at all possible, and then uh, apply that. Uh, with a food grade silicone once it hardens and then uh, just you want to apply a small bead smooth it in there while you're pushing it into the seam the best you can wipe away any excess and allow it to dry before you uh, begin to cool the unit again great we've got another question here and it says flour dust is a problem in our stores vacuum and brush does not do the job of cleaning the condenser what do you recommend 
Um, at that point, you're going to want to reach out to your service provider um, where they can give you options um, to, you know, come in and do a chemical cleaning on the coil, which chemical cleaning is, it's, it does work, but you want to be limited as amount of times you do that because the chemical cleaning of a condenser, that is, it is what it is, a chemical, and it, it can eat away at the aluminum fins of the, of the condenser coil. So you want to do that uh, not very many times in the in the lifetime lifespan of your unit, um, but there's also thing uh, depending on your application. Some service companies may may do uh, you know compressed air blowing back from the other way as long as they take precaution to uh, uh, collect any of that uh, stuff so it doesn't go up into your atmosphere. Yeah, and on the Brindall side too, we do have uh, specific models that we do offer with a, a filter on the front of them. Uh, it's like, like we mentioned earlier, it's not something we recommend to add to a unit in the field, but we do have particular models that we do offer filters on. And then also on the Randall side, the majority of our units are available with the compressor able to be flipped from the right side to the left side or the left side to the right side. Uh, that's been a very, uh, popular option used in particular, particularly in pizza operations as uh, folks always try to get the compressor opposite of their dough table. So they're further away from that flower zone. And another note on the, the filter we do provide uh, on the, the customers that spec a filter with the equipment. It is an aluminum mesh filter, uh, which is uh, allows much more air passage than the the roll type filter media that, that we saw in the picture on the previous slide. And the aluminum mesh filter allows the customer to simply pop it off with one finger, um, spray it off in a sink, or uh, even have people put it running through a dishwasher before. So um, it, it's it's built to, it should say it's designed to uh, have this filter on it and still provide adequate airflow to the condenser. Yeah, and, w and when we do install, <clears throat> that style of filter onto units. We also have programming that coincides with it. So when it, when it has a filter in place, there will be a included in the controller. There's a program that'll tell you when the condenser starts to heat up, and uh, it's time to check your filter. Great. We've got a couple more questions here. The next question I've got for you is, what makes coolant stop functioning? Coolant does not stop functioning. Um, coolant, um, usually when it stops functioning is usually a leak in the system, the coolant has leaked out. Um, because it's, it, refrigeration systems are sealed systems, so it, uh, um, theoretically if a sealed system, if everything's working right, you never have to do anything with it. It'll, it'll run, uh, run forever. Um, however, there's things that, like I mentioned, it, it could be a leak in the system. If refrigerant leaks out, that will give the effect that it's uh, you know not working properly. Um, if back to the things we've been talking about, a restricted condenser coil, restricted coil, condenser coil running over time um, will cause higher temperature of the condenser. That higher temperature is then transfers directly inside the compressor where the oils are. You know if that oil runs at a high temperature for too long. That oil can break down and begin to become acidic, and that could also give you the effect of uh, in inefficient cooling. And, in, and even worse, could cause a compressor to fail if, if left gone um, un, unmaintained for some time. Great. Thank that you, Scott. Answers the really question. Good. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate that. Uh, the final question I have here, I'm not seeing any more come in, is, what are the top or most common ways a rail malfunctions in a refrigeration unit? Yep, I'll let you take that, Scott. I think that pitches sure. right to the last, uh, the last one about refrigerant loss. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, there, there's many things. Uh, you know, what it, uh, rail not cooling um, or rail malfunctioning. Um, it could be back to what we just re just got off done talking about is the refrigerant. If there's a leak in the system, you'll generally see that on the rail first, especially with the uh, 
some of the older, you know, 404A systems where we have one compressor operating both the, the base and the rail. Uh, so if they were low on refrigerant, you would see that in the rail first. Uh, other things, you know, a, sense, a thermostat um, on older systems or maybe a somewhat newer system where it has a Dixel controller could be a sensing probe. Simply has gone bad. Um, uh, heat, uh, excessive heat on the condenser coil, um, not not from losing refrigerant, but if it's in a hot environment, if you've got a kitchen that's over 86 degrees and it's struggling, it's just very hot in there, um, that condenser may not be able to remove the amount of heat it should from the refrigeration system, which is a direct impact on um, your cooling capability for, for the rail. So, um, so there, there's many things um, that would cause the rail to act uh, as if it's not cooling properly. Yeah, yeah and, and one down of the, to some of your, go ahead, Dave. Oh, I was going to say, it's one of the things I mentioned earlier that was a, it's kind of a common thing that comes up and that's the use of covers. So, in, and we, we see it occasionally on restaurants that like Scott mentioned there, it's a very hot kitchen where it's over 86 degrees consistently, but then open air kitchens, they have a tendency to, uh, have more performance issues in the pan opening. So if it's an open open concept where the dining room and the kitchen kind of share a space and there's no wall or anything that disrupts the airflow from the ventilation pulling the air across the top of the pan opening. So if there's just a lift off cover in place or nothing to really sh help shroud the cold around the pan opening and up allow the pan to hold cold above the pans, uh, you can see uh, reduced performance on the pan openings with that too. So the best solution for that is if if possible, add add some sort of cover back to the unit to help protect the cold inside the pan opening. Great. That's really, really good information to know. Um, thank you everyone for your questions as well. So thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, the contact information for Unified Brands will be on the screen in one second. Make sure to complete the short survey heading your way to let us know what you think. Your feedback will help to inform us of the topics, format, and timing that best meets your needs for future events. This webinar is one of several we are hosting as part of our Summer Webinar Festival series, and we hope you'll join us on August 8th for the next webinar featuring our partners at Blodgett and throughout the rest of the summer for great preventative maintenance and equipment troubleshooting content straight from several of our manufacturer partners and industry experts. Thank you also to our partners at Randell and Unified Brands for your time and valuable information provided today. Everyone, have a great afternoon.